All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And you've tuned in to a very special night. I don't even know what night it is. Like I said, I think it's the first night that we're <laughs> discussing this sutra. Um, it's a beautiful sutra. It's called the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. I think I've shortened it for now. Akshayamati, the inexhaustible sutra. It's actually the Bodhisattva inexhaustible or inexhaustible intellect, Akshayamati. So Mati is this mind. And, you know, if, if it's your first night here, just to get us back up to speed, this Bodhisattva here, it's a pretty simple sutra in that way. Bodhisattva Akshayamati goes to the Buddha and says, hey, how does, how does a Bodhisattva become enlightened? How do they develop a mind of enlightenment? In particular, we're talking about this Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And the question is, is well, how, how does a normal you know, human being like you and I, how do we achieve such a state? The Buddha tells Bodhisattva Akshayamati, well, through the cultivation, practice, observation of these 10 paramitas. Paramitas is this word. Um, it gets translated into English as perfection. I'm not a fan of perfection because the word paramita sort of means to cross over or to ferry over, to transport over. And so what a paramita is, is some, a something, a quality or an act or a virtue that transports one to nirvana or the end of suffering or enlightenment. So these are these transcendences. They, they transcend us out of this suffering state of a human being. That's what we're talking about. We have in you know, some alternate universe, we have already discussed the first six paramitas. These are also the standard paramitas, dana, giving, shila, moral discipline, kashanti, patience, virya, drive, determination, Dhyana, meditation, and then pranya, this kind of wisdom. And just to recap last week really quickly, these first six paramitas that I just rattled off very quickly, these are a standard part of Buddhism. Meditation, generosity, all of these things are very, it's like, it doesn't matter what, what school, what sect, what country, what century. I mean, those are, that's Buddhism. But last week I spent the entire hour and a half Dharma doors talking about this idea of upaya, skillful means, expedient means, expediency, ingenuity, there's a lot of different ways that this word gets translated. And truly, upaya, upaya might be the trickiest to translate. It might be that, that one idea that we, we just need to keep it as upaya. We, we can't translate it. It just, it is upaya, right? But I did my best last week to try to explain you know, mainly actually what I, how I wanted to start tonight was to explain what happened last week. So last week, we didn't do our traditional 10 dharmas, our traditional 10 practices that are foremost in the practice of upaya. And I did that for many reasons, but last week we just talked about upaya. 
And I wanted to do that. I, I, I wanted to make a clean break between these earlier paramitas and this upaya. And I wanted to make this kind of clear break because of like how special and important this idea is. It's, it's like, it needs, you need to take a moment and be like, oh, wow, that's a really profound idea. The idea of skillfulness. And, and I, I can't do it. I already, I was about to do it. I was about to digress into a Dharma talk about Upaya, which is last week. But it, it's this importance of conveying how, you know, the main idea, okay, if it, if I could just summarize it in one simple idea, it's about how upaya, skillfulness or skillful means, it's about how you, you can't prescribe what upaya is. You can't say it beforehand because it actually arises in the moment. And it's this idea that, you know, last week I went off about teaching the Dharma and maturing sentient beings and all of this really bodhisattva talk, but I also tried to dial it back. And, you know, I used the analogy that, you know, if you had some really tough uh, news, you had some tough information that you had to convey to somebody, you could do it really callously, harshly, you know, just like, oh, by the way, your dad died today. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wait, whoops. So you could do it really blunt or you could deliver that information skillfully. And how, how, how one would do that would depend entirely on who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, where you're talking to, like everything. It's entirely, entirely contextual how that skillfulness will take place. And that indeed is what is so special about Upaya is that it, you can't say it ahead of time. It truly arises in the moment. And, you know, like jazz and funk music, you know it when you hear it, you know it when you feel it. It's that idea that you, it's like, what is upaya? You'll know it, you'll know it when it happens. You <laughs> kind of a thing, right? And, and, you know, again, see last week for a more detailed discussion about upaya, but the one idea I wanted us to, to just settle on tonight is this, it's this idea that you just don't know what it would look like to be skillful. And that's actually what it means to be skillful is to be present, attentive, and then responsive. It's like, it's so deeply Buddhist to be present, attentive, and responsive. You know, I can't put it, you know, I probably couldn't put it any better than that. So I'm just going to leave it at that, that this upaya is this very, you know, interesting idea about skillful means. And again, last week I stressed teaching and pedagogy and conveying information skillfully, but this upaya goes, it goes for everything. It, it's, it's about tact. It's about sensitivity. It's about all of these ideas. And so tonight we get to do our, our, our greatly anticipated deep dive into Upaya. The Buddha has told us 10 dharmas, 10 things, 10 practices, 10 observations that are foremost in the practice of Upaya. So we're going to talk about these 10 things, and um, they're all on their own. Each of them is fascinating. I'm going to try to do my best to keep kind of making them relevant to upaya in that way. 
Oh, and by the way, one last thing about last week and why I, I kind of made last week just this intro to Opaya. And it's because, you know, this practice of Upaya, like practicing it, exercising it, doing, doing it. There's a certain kind of idea within the practice, the Bodhisattva path here, that the first six paramitas that we discussed, they are very, very important for getting sort of one's own house in order, one's uh, mental house, so to speak. And the, so the idea is, is that at a certain point, and who knows when this is going to happen, it, 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 you know, it'll happen. But there's a certain moment when the Bodhisattva is ready to, you know, kind of that, that their house is in order and they're ready to start um, interacting in that way, whether it's via teaching or whether it's, again, it's a variety of ways. I'm a teacher, so I tend to, to always go back to that position, but I hope you can, and uh, I hope that you can translate this into your life, into your practice. So what skillfulness might look like for you. And so uh, whether you're a teacher or not, I'm hoping that you can you know, get something out of this. All right. So we did last week, we, did, we touched upon the, the first one. And you know, I'm gonna start there. It's tricky because it, it sounds weird from the beginning. So the number one Dharma, the number, the first, I shouldn't say the number one, because that sounds like that's the top. So this is the first. The first practice of Upaya is this idea of entering, entering, penetrating the minds of sentient beings. In particular, it is the idea of penetrating or entering not just the minds, but the mentalities. And as I translated here, entering the minds, thought habits, desires, and joys of sentient beings. So that's number one. We're going to go down the list nice and slow. And because we talked about this last week, I'm not going to dwell on it too long. I talked about the weird verb. It's here, it's a little Chinese, you know, we're reading or I'm translating from the Chinese version of the sutra. But even in Sanskrit, this idea of entering or penetrating, it can sound kind of weird. But last week I tried to do my best to, to uh, de-weird it, right? To make it less weird in that sense. and. And I think, I forget who it was. I think it might've been Tanya or somebody, but somebody was like, oh, it's about sort of like, you know, um, cause I, I mentioned that in Chinese they talk about entering a mountain, but it's not entering it, like going into it. It means to like enter the environment of the mountain. And so this is about entering or penetrating the environment and minds and mind habits and desires and joys of sentient beings. And the way that I tried to describe it last week is that this first act of the Bodhisattva in the practice of Upaya is about, I mean, you could kind of call this empathy but even in English, em, em, empathy, em, em, um, it, it's still sort of me and you in a very kind of way. It's like, I'm being empathetic towards you. And this upaya of entering the minds of sentient beings is about deeply, it's like, I, I think I even said this last week, this kind of euphemism of, of standing in somebody else's shoes right? We have this euphemism in English, like to stand or be in somebody else's shoes. And that's, yeah, I guess that's empathy. But this upayak act of entering the minds, habits, desires, and joys of sentient beings 
it's about really deeply tr like imagining what it's like to be that other person deeply and really deeply understanding their joys, their, their everything. And that alone actually is the first practice of the paramita, or sorry, uh, the first practice of the upaya paramita. It's just this idea of deeply entering the world or environment of sentient beings. So it's about empathy in that way. Last week I explained, or the way that I explained it was, you know, it's about if one is going to be upayek, if one is going to employ a skillful means, if one is really going to try to develop some sort of upaya, some sort of analogy or simile, or just, it doesn't even have to be an analog or a simile or a metaphor. It could just be a mode of speech. And that, you know, that mode of, my mode of speech might be really direct. It might be actually very curt, very straight, very to the point. But I don't know, again, because <laughs> the situation might call for that. But the idea is, is that if the bodhisattva can really enter the mentality and mental habits of another and really put themselves in the other's shoes, the idea is, okay, yeah, then they just want, they're, they're the type of person that's just going to want to hear it direct. Oh, no, 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 no. This is the type of person that's going to really need this put delicately. I'm going to need to, I'm going to need to dance around this for a while and ease them into this, right? But again, it's like you, you wouldn't know ahead of time, but in terms of being present and then in this empathetic bodhisattva way of entering the minds of sentient beings, you could then develop what is the best way to put this for this person now here. And I want to emphasize that, this idea of now and here, because it means tomorrow, it might not be the same upaya. <laughs> it might, it's a new day, a new, we're in a new location, whatever it is. All right, so that's the first one. Again, if you have like really burning questions about that, please see part one. But if there's any lingering ideas or questions, ideas, comments about this idea, Last week, I also related this to reading people's minds, but it's not about telepathy so much as, again, empathy in that way. Okay, yeah, again, that's, that's review. That's totally a review. But now, new territory. So the second practice or observation of the bodhisattva in the practice of upaya, the upaya paramita, number two. So I translate it as strengthening sentient beings by way of power. Our standard English translation of a treasury of Mahayana sutras, they translate this as strengthening sentient beings with his power. And this is where they just love to insert, you know, male particles, any chance they get, any chance they can do this, they love to do it, even though, so by the way, if I've never said this, I don't think I've ever said this. I love working with the Chinese language and working with Chinese Buddhist texts because there's no particles. There's no he or she in Chinese. The bodhisattva is the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva does what the bodhisattva does. We, in Chinese, it's really wonderful, actually, that you don't have to decide whether the bodhisattva is male or female or who knows, you know, it's just like, it's wide open, actually. And it, actually, even in English, even in English, by the way, you don't have to add an article. 
you don't have to add he it's a choice to do that it's a very very um it's a very particular choice where you really want to re-emphasize this idea of a certain what you know they call it patriarchy or whatever but it's a choice to keep emphasizing that bodhisattvas are male he does this he does that again in the chinese and also by the way the sanskrit it is not male or female it is it is the bodhisattva and so i'm not going to do this version strengthening sentient beings with his power i'm going to go with mine that the second dharma is strengthening sentient beings by way of power this is complicated enough without the without the politics frankly so just this idea so number two is this idea of um these two characters they mean increasing power and you know this is a really interesting idea in fact the next paramita that we're going to be talking about uh, next sunday is bala bala is power bala is a sanskrit word it's actually where we get the english word ballistics ballistics bala or in spanish uh, bullets or balas so in spanish bullets or balas their power and that word balas ballistics ballistic missile all of these words come from the sanskrit bala power so let's dispense with the the missiles and the arms and the guns and all of that the bodhisattva has bala cultivates bala we're, we're going to get to that but there's a little bit of foreshadowing going on here which is that the bodhisattva increases sentient beings power that's what this second one is about and i mentioned this last week and it'll come up again it'll come up again in number four but i just want to say that a big part of the bodhisattva path is this idea of maturing sentient beings so we're, again we're going to get to that in number four in a second we've already seen it a few times by the way but you know and and i've said this before too but i'll say it again the language of the bodhisattva maturing sentient beings it gets misconstrued in english translations of all of this where the bodhisattva is saving sentient beings there's no saving in buddhism there's no, that's not it's not going on it's not how this is working and so it's an unfortunate kind of um kind of christian holdover in english where they were like, oh, well, the Bodhisattva sounds a little bit like a mini Jesus and mini Jesuses are into saving me. So Bodhi, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. And as I've put it, the language is not about saving. It's actually about maturing, enriching. And, and the analogy that I've used is the Bodhisattva walks by a sentient being that is thirsty it might be a plant it might be an animal it might be a human whatever but if the plant is like it's got these sad little wilty leaves and it's the plant is is like help help a little water over here the bodhisattva hears the call and it's like yo that plant could use some water and enriches and matures the life of that sentient being by giving it some water. But the same way, if the Bodhisattva is walking down the street and there's some dog on the side of the sidewalk, and you know how dogs will start rolling on cold concrete when they're really thirsty? So you are like, well, that dog is really, really thirsty. That dog is trying to uh, hydrate itself through its skin, but it's not gonna get very far on cold concrete. 
I should give it some water. And so the Bodhisattva gives him some water. Or a human being needs something to drink. Hey, you want to drink? Give you, you know. So the idea is, is that the this idea of maturing sentient beings, well, let's take the opposite. The opposite is the non-bodhisattva who does not recognize that the plant is starving. And as I've said in previous Dharma talks, would just as easily step on that plant. Would just as easily mindlessly step on the sentient being, right? So that's a non-bodhisattva, <laughs> mindless, self-involved, not empathetic. The bodhisattva is sort of in this like, you know, I don't want to put them in a superhero status, but they're kind of, you know, trying to make sure everything's going okay, trying to make sure everybody's doing okay, trying to make sure even all the plants are doing okay. And yeah, it's a practice of mindfulness, empathy, all kinds of stuff to be concerned about other beings. But that's the bodhisattva path. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's the bodhisattva path is to actually be concerned about other beings. <laughs> so this idea of maturing sentient beings is not as, it's not as, uh, what is the word, like, uh, de like delusions of grandeur, right? Where it's like, oh, I got to save everybody. No, no, no. Like, don't, don't, don't worry, but it is about responding to your environment. Michael, I have that, a question. Was that um, Connie I heard? Yes, hi. 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 Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a little, I'm wondering, you know, what saving, I'm questioning what saving really means. I mean, in the Christian tradition, you know, like saving can be a very, like it has different nuances. And when I think about, I just don't want to only put it in a negative understanding, like we might approach it with from coming from Christianity, right? But when you think, when we think about um, bodhisattvas, they, I mean, they take basically, if you, if, you know, if you take it seriously or they seriously, they, they make a vow, a vow uh, or they take a vow um, to liberate all sentient beings. So they come back. So you could also call it saving. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to be a little bit sensitive around saving, <laughs> the term saving. Absolutely, Connie. Absolutely. And you, you caught me. I was actually being a little too effusive in that denial of the language. So you're totally right, Connie. And I, I would suggest that if we were going to use the language of saving, which we could, and you know, people do, so let's. I would suggest though that within the context of Buddhism, the bodhisattva is saving the sentient being from themselves. <laughs> Meaning, you know, this, this beautiful Dharma that we are here to discuss which is this dharma about clinging, craving, wanting, and then suffering. This beautiful dharma, this beautiful teaching, this beautiful truth about how we cause ourselves suffering. That's the dharma, that we are doing this to ourselves in a weird way through folly, through delusion, greed, and anger, all of these things that we're kind of doing this to ourselves. And so, yes, Connie, the Bodhisattva comes to save us from that. So I, I'm with you and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to completely throw the language of saving under the bus. You caught me. I don't actually want to do that. And, and I do want to kind of uh, respect this idea of altruism of like, you know, whether we call it saving or helping or whatever. Regarding Christianity, though, that's, of course, a very different religious tradition with a very different, um, I mean, they would call it theology. In Buddhism, we're not even dealing with a theology, but ideology, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, the Christian tradition is dealing with a very different 
ideology. And so what it means to be saved in that context, it, it has a very specific meaning within the Christian context. And I'm just always hesitant to put the Bodhisattva as one who's in the business of doing that. Because I don't think the Bodhisattva is in the business of doing that. <laughs> and I don't want to put that down. <laughs> it's like tricky because, you know, I'm kind of a, like a secret Christian in a certain way, like that I have a certain respect for that tradition and the ideology of it. So. Yeah. Well, and we still, we interact with each other through language. So it's always, you know, um, limited. But um, yeah, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful statement, Connie. Okay, that was all regarding this idea of maturing, enriching, saving sentient beings. But number two is actually about empowering sentient beings. So it's in the same vein as we're talking about, which is this kind of altruistic helping vibe. But number two is about increasing sentient beings power and i would ask you then at this point to let's you know bala power this idea of power you know i think in english we are very um well i don't like to assume this but in in general in english we're pretty well versed in the language of empowerment and what it means to be empowered versus what it means to be disempowered, that type of language, right? And this can go in a variety of ways where, um, or, or it could be a variety of situations in which sentient beings are disempowered or empowered, right? Disempowered, subject to, underneath, trodden upon, all kinds of ideas come with the idea of disempowered. And empowered has a sense of sovereignty, has a, a sense of freedom, has a sense of self-sufficiency or self-reliance in that way. And, you know, like all of these, I'm offering interpretation with what knowledge I have about the, the languages and the tradition here. But the idea of this one does seem to be that it's about instilling in sentient beings a sense of empowerment rather than a sense of disempowerment. So the Bodhisattva is sort of about getting people to get like, like you can do it. <laughs> but like, that would be probably the simplest way to put this one, number two, is that the Bodhisattva is like, you can do it, you can do it. The non-Bodhisattva is like, you'll never win. You'll never, you're just give up now, <laughs> right? Because that's disempowering language. Discouraging, discouraging, right? You, we, the Bodhisattva is encouraging, empowering. It's about you can do it in this. So, th but by the way, I, I want to like, I, I want to, I need to say this somehow because it's like, I'm, I'm already like, so um, I feel very divided here and I want to make this clear. This Bodhisattva practice sort of, it has like an exalted level, right? In which like Bodhisattvas are deeply, I mean, they're practically Buddhas. They're like, like trying to enlighten the world, right? So there's that. But then there's sort of what I was talking about in terms of like upaya or skillfulness and that it could just be delivering some, some tough information in a very skillful way. Now, nobody's getting enlightened, nobody's going to nirvana, but, but there's a delicate balance in giving the information delicately or giving it harshly and bluntly, right? So I wanna make clear that I'm, I'm already trying to juggle this. How does this apply at the most basic level? And how does this apply at the most exalted level? And so with this one, I would say that at the, 
at the most basic level, it's about being encouraging versus being discouraging. Don't, you know, you don't want to like discourage, you want to encourage, you want to really get people and everybody for that matter to, you know, go strive for their best in a way and not sort of get depressed and shrink in that way. So that's at the most basic level. But I do want you to know that part of what is involved in number two, when we're talking about bala and power, in particular, the power of the bodhisattva, with, when we're talking about upaya and bala, power and skillful means together, at the most exalted level of this, we are talking about some very, very serious magic. <laughs> We're talking about some serious displays of miraculous powers that ultimately encourage those who witness those powers to basically be like, whoa, oh, okay. Like there's a way in which the display of a miraculous power could, and in a way should, get one to question the world that they live in. And by the way, just because it's been, it's like been on the back of my mind for a second since Connie mentioned um, about salvation and Christianity and all of that, there's a very, very interesting story in the New Testament, in the Bible, about a, a, a you know, maybe a bodhisattva or what, God or whatever, but about Jesus walking on water. And this display that gives, uh, in particular, like Peter, this like, whoa, this, this like uh, uh, an encouragement of faith. And there's, a, of course, a funny story about Peter trying to walk in on water. And then as soon as he loses his faith, he, he falls through it. But the idea is, is that this exalted level of the application of power in order to sort of upayakly change lives, this is not just in Buddhism that you see this type of thing going on. So I just want to make that reference that there's a way of looking at the miracles of Jesus as upaya within that tradition. And the idea being that people are like, whoa, where'd all these fish come from? <laughs> that, that sort of actually is part of what number two is talking about. Where'd all this bread come from? Where all the wine? He's got wine too? It's like, there's this whole kind of thing um, about that. There's a way to read New Testament miracles as bala, as um, miraculous acts of upaya. Okay, everybody okay with uh, the power? We're gonna talk about powers all next week. So if you have questions about actual super normal power type stuff, save it for next week. Bye. Everybody doing good? Michael, there's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, great question, Ray. Um, well, I mean, if you're talking about, uh, Ray, if you're talking about an actual martyr, you know, a martyr is one who dies for the faith. And that's a pretty heavy duty situation within the, the history of Christianity, which is, you know, people being put to death for their faith in this kind of new God or this new uh, savior figure. And that act of, you know, not recanting of being like, okay, but that's, this is what I believe. And actually been being um, put to death, you know, um, by whatever government actually, that's martyrdom. And in Buddhism, you know, that, I, I mean, you know, you think about the, the classic example of the Vietnamese Buddhist monk who lights himself on fire in protest of the Vietnam War. I don't even, you know, within, within the definition of martyrdom I just gave, that's not martyrdom. But we would probably call it being a martyr. But I just want to make clear that what a martyr originally was, was this sort of like, I'm holding on to this faith, even though the state, the Roman Empire, 
is going to come and get me. And that's sort of very different, yeah, than the Bodhisattva path, which, you know, as I'm trying to describe it, as far as there being like a very basic way and a very exalted way, there's a wide spectrum of Bodhisattva-ness, of Bodhisattva-hood in that way. <laughs> so thanks, Ray. Okay, number three, number three is probably the easiest, <laughs> it's, it's the easiest on the list. The, no, the number three Dharma that the Bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of Upaya is great kindness and great compassion, period, done. And we're talking Maha Metta, Maha Karuna, not just metta and karuna, not just kindness or loving kindness, that's metta, and then karuna, compassion. So not just loving kindness and compassion, but maha metta, maha karuna, great kindness, great compassion. And the, the adjectives the idea of great or maha metta and karuna, it's, it's kind of serious in a way because the practice of extending metta or loving kindness, of extending karuna or compassion, even mudita, empathic joy, this has been a practice even before Buddhism. Meditative states, of expanding the heart center and spreading kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and ultimately even uh, upeksha, equanimity, extending these things out. Um, you know, the origin of these, by the way, in Buddhism, these go way, 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 way back. The practice of these things go way back. But in Buddhism, the story is that a bunch of monks were trying to meditate in a forest and there were a bunch of yakshas, a bunch of nature spirits, uh, tree spirits basically, that were causing a ruckus and the monks couldn't meditate. And the Buddha said, oh, well, let me teach you this great practice and extend to the yakshas, the, the tree spirits, extend to them loving kindness, compassion, mudita, and ultimately upeksha, and then you'll be able to meditate. That was the original version of the Brahma Viharas, com uh, kindness, compassion, mudita, and upeksha. It was about these, kind. you can imagine it as if, if your neighbors were having a party, very loud party, and you were trying to meditate. And the Buddha said, oh, well, you could do this then. You, rather than being mad at them, you could extend them loving kindness, compassion, keep going, keep going, empathic joy. You're, you're excited they're having a party. You're actually happy that they're happy. And then fourth, equanimity, and now you can meditate because you're in this equanimity state and they're partying, but you're happy they're partying. You no longer care that they're causing a ruckus because it's no longer a ruckus. That was the original version of this in the early school of Buddhism. Once we get into the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path, they take these ideas of, of kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and, and uh, equanimity. They take them to a Maha level. And so this is not about my meditation, my mind, my heart being disturbed. And therefore, if I extend this lovingness, I can then um, kind of be chill and now I can meditate. Again, that was kind of the early version of this, but that was about you. That was about your mind. That was about your meditation. As I've described pretty much in every Dharma talk related to this sutra, the bodhisattva is involved in this like really deep practice of loving kindness. And it is not for their own benefit. 
that would actually be antithetical to the bodhisattva practice and the bodhisattva path. It is actually about like you being better, <laughs> you, it, whether you need kindness, compassion, a little empathic joy or equanimity, the bodhisattva is sort of doing it for all sentient beings, not for their own quiescence in that way. It, 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 it might arguably be a result <laughs> that the bodhisattva is quiescent as a result of this, but that is not the objective, if that makes sense. Great compassion and great kindness. Yeah. Number four, number four is what I was talking about before. It is the maturing of sentient beings, but in particular, in particular, what the Upaya column step four says is that the Bodhisattva practices this maturing of sentient beings without wearying without growing tired. The, the um, um, it's not an assumption, but what's being said is that in earlier, in earlier paramitas, the bodhisattva practiced maturing sentient beings. But the idea was, is that in earlier stages, it was a little hard to do. I mean, it, it was like, it was effortful to do that. Like, so the bodhisattva in the early stages actually has to sort of stop and be like, you know what? That plant could use some water. And even though I'm, I got places to go, I'm going to water the plant or I'm gonna stop and give that dog some water or I'm gonna stop and have a drink with a friend whatever there's liquids involved or whatever but the idea is is that this sort of early stage bodhisattva it's an effort that the bodhisattva puts forth to mature sentient beings in whatever way that might be but again it's effortful in this stage of upaya where the bodhisattva is like super tuned in to the minds of sentient beings, the habits, the desires, the joys of sentient beings. The idea is, is that they are effortlessly maturing sentient beings. They, they're doing it in their sleep. They don't even know they're doing it anymore. It's just that much a part of what their kind of makeup is at that point. So if you've been following along, and you were like, hey, I thought maturing sentient beings was way back. It did come up way back, but it was with effort. And at this stage, the Bodhisattva mature sentient beings effortlessly. That's the idea. Okay. Number five is where it starts to get tricky. So the fifth practice or dharma that the bodhisattva considers foremost when practicing upaya or skillful means. The fifth is, so the language is really weird. What do, the, what do they have? I'm curious actually what they have. Oh yeah, so they didn't, they didn't do you any favors here. So in the English translation, the fifth one is called rejecting the states of the Shravaka and Pratekya Buddha. So the Shravaka voice hearer is a term for the early old school Buddhist monk or nun who, you know, just to tie it into this Dharma talk, a Shravaka is somebody who was doing the metta and, and Karuna practice so that they could meditate. I'm trying to be an Arhat here. Will you keep it down? Right. So that's the Shravaka. I'm trying to achieve our hotship here. <laughs> so that's the Shravaka. The solitary enlightened one, the Pratekya Buddha. Interesting idea, of course, in Buddhism. Buddhism recognizes that enlightenment can happen anywhere, anytime, not just through the Dharma, not just through sutras. So the solitary enlightened one, the Pratekya Buddha, is this sort of 
I mean, there's a lot to this, this uh, character in Buddhism, but you could think of it as somebody who has an epiphany. They're like, you know, they're fly fishing or whatever. <laughs> they're out there in the lake and they have this epiphany and it's, it's about Dharma. And of course they stop fly fishing. You know, they put the, they put the, the reel down and they realize, wow. And then the idea is, is that they just go into a cave and, and are enlightened. They are solitary enlightened ones. And from the Buddhist point of view, it's like, well, that's great that they realize the truth, but it's not so great that they're just in a cave for the rest of their life. It would be nice if they came and told some other people about their realizations. So that's a Shravaka, a following monk, or a Pratekya Buddha, right? And the fifth one is about, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reject this, I'll tell you that. And the fifth one is about being free of, so it's actually not about rejecting, it's actually about liberation, about being free of the stages of a Shravaka or a Pratekya Buddha, the stages of a voice here or a solitary enlightened one. And this is a very, very complicated one. Um, but I know that many of you um, who have been uh, studying with me or coming to Dharma doors, you've heard me talk about, say, for example, the four jhanas and the four formless jhanas, also known as the four formless samadhis. So there's this general rubric or this general um, meditation schema in early Buddhism. That is, you pass through these four stages of jhana, uh, finishing that with upeksha, which then crosses you over into the four formless realms, the four formless samadhis, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, and then the state of neither perception nor non-perception. And that's sort of like the stages of a shravaka. There's also, by the way, the stages of once returner, non-returner, and arhat, a stream enterer to start that. So stream enterer, once returner, non-hunter, non-returner, and arhat. Those are also considered these stages. There are stages to the development of solitary enlightenment, the Prateki Buddha path. Those have stages as well. And so what this number five is, is the Bodhisattva practicing Upaya is free of or liberates, uh, uh, is free of the stages of the old school path, the Pratekya Buddha path, all of that. There's a lot, there's a lot to this one. Um, just because the idea of stages in Buddhism are very important. And so for this sutra to say, yeah, the Bodhisattva uh, kind of liberate is liberated of all stages in that way. If you're, if you're really, really well versed in Dharma, then that would be like, what? <laughs> like, how could they do that? Like, <laughs> and there's a lot of ways I could interpret this. Oh, there's so many ways to interpret this one. So, of course, the first way to interpret this is about how this bodhisattva path that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks now, this bodhisattva path is, it's a, it's a unique path. <laughs> and it is not the old school Buddhist path to, to our hot ship, to nirvana. And it's not even a kind of, um, middle period path of becoming a Pratekya Buddha. Yeah, I, 
I'm often tempted to digress into a conversation about Pratekya Buddhas, but it just, it wouldn't be really fruitful. But I just want you to know that there's a lot to these ideas of stages of development, whether it's a Shravaka or a Pratekya Buddha. And in fact, even the Bodhisattva path has stages of development, by the way. So there are these various stages and even the language of stage is like, well, A, it's unfortunate because these are not actors on a stage. It's not what we're talking about. The, a better interpretation might be like plateau because it's about these plateaus of development, right? But the point is, the point is for tonight, because I have, I have more, I got five more dharmas to talk about. So the point of this one, you, we need to keep in mind that we're talking about upaya. And so what we mean by upaya at that, at that point is flexibility, is, you know, you can't get trapped into these this stage comes after that stage. It's like, no, 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 it's not about that. At this, when we're talking about upaya. And so again, I, I, I just referenced it quickly that yeah, even bodhisattvas have stages. And all this says is that the bodhisattva is done with those stages of the, of the Shravaka and the Pradekya Buddha. They're done with old school Buddhism and, in, and even middle period Buddhism. We're on to the new, new which is to say the Mahayana. And so what it's saying is, is the Bodhisattva is done with those old kinds of stages. And because we're talking about Upaya, the Bodhisattva is flexible in regards to ideas of stages. I hope that makes sense because again these ideas like, there's actually many complicated ideas in this in this one number five good no he no he's got it he's, he knows what i'm talking about right <laughs> but yeah it's the you know i just want you to know that you know buddhism is a lot especially when this sutra is appearing there's already a long history behind it of hierarchies and strata and all this kind of stuff and so this is sort of dismissing a lot of the various hierarchies that have come before in the in the sake or for the sake of upaya michael i do have a question oh cool what's up Norma? um since since upaya seems to be relational like it's about the relationship between the bodhisattva and others is there an implication here that the Bodhisattva is flexible with regard to other people's stages, hmm. sort of not pigeonholing other people in their dealings with them? Or is it more about that they're flexible with their own stage? The, this particular one is about their own stage. The Bodhisattva is like that the Bodhisattva is frees themselves of thinking in terms of those stages. But I, I don't think your first uh, way of putting it is off the table, but it's more Im implicit, right? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, hey, hey yeah. Michael. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I guess we're getting to the nitty gritty because I, 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 I just like, are they like, it seems like intention is important, uh, like humility, you know, just a sense of like, you can't control it or know it. It's just like, stay open to it, but like that your intention is like, kind of critical to it. And I'm just wondering, like, does it get to that at some point? Or is it? Is it not really about that level of detail uh, or just that way of kind of thinking about it and, and kind of like a like, just let it happen? Ah, is, you know, is that not what they're into? Okay. If I hear you right. Yeah. I would, the, the flexibility 
and openness that I'm talking about as it pertains to Upaya. The idea is it's not, yeah, I mean, again, Brendan, I'm not entirely sure I, I got your question right, but if I did, you wanna to try to reword it? No, I think it was a crappily worded question <laughs> and I'm not even sure under review, um, but, uh... I guess I, one of the things that I guess is coming up is in, is is intention. Yeah. Because I was like thinking about like, that's what I will go to is like, what am I, what do I want here? Mm. Because, because if you, I can, you can get caught up in like your understanding for, for them is going to fix it or something, or, you know, just holding on to like uh, one narrow way of communicating something that's really about like, Hey, I have had some benefit. Maybe you might benefit, you know, and it doesn't really get, have to be any more complicated than that. But if you continue to return to that, you can, you know, sort of get out of a, the mind of like, you know, uh, you know, just the wrong path of like, uh, whatever, just uh, uh, trying to control the message or whatever. But, um, but it sounds like they at least are speaking to that to some degree. That's even a worse wording. So sorry. <laughs> No, but after after a further review, I, I think I, I think I know what you're saying. Um, it's definitely, you know, I. How can I put this? You know, it has a lot to do, by the way, with number three, the great compassion and great kindness. So, you know, that's the bodhisattvas. Um, the you know that's where the bodhisattva is coming from great compassion and great kindness. And so at, in regards to this idea of intention, Brendan, that you bring up, which is a great thing to think about. It's like the intention is great kindness, great compassion. That's the intention. The point being that the Bodhisattva then remains in this very dynamic, responsive, open space always filled with great kindness and great compassion, and then is involved in this beautiful kind of dance with the world in that space. And as it pertains to like, you know, a lot of things, but as it pertains to conveying information, let's say, whether it's teaching or I've got that, I've got that really hard piece of news or whatever, Maybe Bre the thing that came to my mind, Brendan, that might help with what you're asking about, it might be that the upayak thing to do is not say anything at all. That's not my jam, but I, you're right, though. I, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, and no. So the question of sure. intentions a little, yeah. Yeah, well, and it speaks to like, um, you know, whatever. I mean, the soft, like the ultimate soft touch is to just like allow for and and then like, you know, let your face just react or whatever, you know, just do something that, um, yeah, it isn't such like intervention-y. And that's why I like the uh, the thing about not saving because while I kind of agree with uh, uh, with Connie, like the, the sense of urgency, if you're getting down the road of like saving somebody, it will definitely screw up all upaya at least in my in my experience with family members so um yeah sorry for such a digression but no that that helps it was worth it for it. that gem of an insight indeed <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks all right everybody good to go number six is very interesting it pertains to a number of ideas that we've touched upon before. So number six, the number six practice of the Bodhisattva as it pertains to Upaya is this idea of, and I wonder what they have. Not even, not even going to bother. It's so far. Um, but it's about this idea of having the view of superior wisdom. 
And if you if you remember, of course, in Buddhism, and I forget what did I have here? Uh, yeah, the view of superior knowledge or wisdom. So if you remember from past Dharma talks, a view is a drishti. And a drishti, meaning a view, is actually something like a worldview or a political view or a religious view. It's a, it, you know, view doesn't mean with the eyes, it's a disposition towards the world in that way. And so these views, you know, I've, I've talked about these a lot and they're a very, 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 um, it's a very important idea in Buddhism. The, the idea of, of having a view, a drishti, and it gets even more subtle by the way, like even beyond religious views, you could think of like, well, let's put it this way. All of us at some point have probably, have probably considered this idea of what happens when we die. And then maybe if some of us were really kind of wild and adventurous, we've thought about before we were born, like as a weird concept or whatever, not necessarily in a reincarnation way, but just trying to conceive of that idea of before. So, but there's this idea that we have an idea of where we came from, whether it's some just miraculous combination of chemicals. I don't know if you think you're just a miraculous combination of chemicals, but the idea is, is that we have ideas of where we came from and we have ideas of where this is going. So maybe you think you're a miraculous combination of chemicals and that when that miraculous combination of chemicals breaks apart, there's just no more you. So you're kind of a materialist in that sense or what have you, like that's, that's what you think is going on. Guess what? <laughs> that's your view. <laughs> so we all have a view. We all have an opinion or an idea or whatever, a view, a drishti about what's going on here. That this is where we came from. This is where it's going. We also have views about what's important, what's not important, what's moral, what's immoral. All these ideas come together in our view. And again, it's, it's a drishti. So it's not even, if you can imagine, if you can imagine, it's not just a political view. It's not just a religious view. It's not just a moral view. It's actually a drishti is all of it. It's your worldview. It's like the whole, it's what you think's going on here. And I've done all of these Dharma talks. I've done many a Dharma talk about how, and, and by the way, this is going to be the superior knowledge that this is talking about. Buddhism and the Buddha, Dharma, has this very, 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 very profound idea. And it's about not having a drishti. It's about not clinging to a view. Michael, you just said two things. You said not having a trishti or not clinging to trishti? What is the language? Okay. Yeah, what, what is that, right? What does it mean to... I mean, it, it, there is a difference between having a few and attaching, a, being attached to a few, right? In, indeed, indeed. And I, I would suggest from, from a Buddhist point of view that all drishtis are attached to in that sense, it, like if you have it, then you are attached to it in that sense. So my language was one of semantics in that sense. It's just a matter of word use. The idea though is, is that if you can really, you know, just think about this. It's this idea that we all have views, but the Dharma is about not clinging to those views. And what's so subtly beautiful about this idea, and by the way, for me, this is Dharma, like this is Dharma. 
it's this subtle, it's so subtle, it's crazy. But it's this idea that the moment that you're like, oh, okay, Buddha, I won't have a view. You have now made that your view. And that's not what the Buddha is talking about. It's not Dharma. So then if you're like, oh, okay, then I, <laughs> ah, like, <laughs> wait a minute, I don't know what to do then. Because I can't attach to the view that it, I shouldn't have a view. But and then if I have my views about like whatever, the Buddha is saying I shouldn't be attached to those views. And then you kind of realize, oh, Maybe maybe he was serious about this non-attachment thing. Yeah, Mikey, but what I was what I've been always wondering, and I'm still wondering, like, you know, we, we talk about the 10 parameters, one, two, three, four, five, and this list, five samskaras and obstructions and four noble truth and blah blah. And there's nirvana and there's samsara and do this and do that, and not like, you know, like not you know, you have this, uh, I'm not saying a roadmap or a guideline, but there's principles, you have them in, in, in Buddhism, right? And then on the other hand, you have this non-conceptual understanding of reality. And, you know, like sometimes, I mean, they are not opposites, but, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, it confuses me, you know? No, I know, I know, Connie, I, I really, I hear you and I, it's, and it's about that, that beautiful line. It's about this beautiful line from the Diamond Sutra, from the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. And it's this beautiful part where the Buddha describes about the Dharma being like a raft. And these teachings are like a raft. They're a support network to, and ultimately what's wild about it, Connie, in terms of what you're, what you're kind of bringing up, is that, you know, and, and by the way, Connie, I've heard you, your, your questions are as usual, like so good, but in particular tonight, your use of language and also you, you calling me on my language, it's like, bravo, like really it's what I'm talking about. But what I mean to say is, is that we're in language, we're stuck in it, we're born into it, we're conditioned by it, we're using it, and so, a lot of what this is about is like, well, how do you then use this thing that's kind of the problem, but how do you use it to get out of the problem? And so the Buddha says, yeah, my Dharma is like a raft. Once you get to the other shore, it's only a fool that carries the raft around on their head. Or to use the classic Zen statement, it's like the finger pointing at the moon. Don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. All of this is like that. And so what this teaching of not having a drishti, the reason why it's so profound is that it, all of this dharma is like a ladder that we're using to get out of this hole that we're in. But liberation is not the ladder. It's certainly not the hole. But we need the ladder to get out of the hole in that way. And so we celebrate the ladder. We, we sometimes might even worship the ladder but even the buddha is saying but don't you know that you really this is what is, is again so profound about this teaching it's saying that if you're attached to the ladder meaning you're attached to the dharma you might as well be attached to all kinds of other stuff because attachment is the problem even if it's to something as noble as the dharma and so again this teaching of the superior knowledge. And so, by the way, just to, to, to um, kind of try to start wrapping this up a little bit, even though we're on number six, um, the idea of the view of superior knowledge, it's kind of the way I interpret it, a play on this idea, which is that the, like, the drishti is to not have a drishti. That's the drishti of superior knowledge. So they're doing a kind of funny language game here that you kind of, I think, need to be kind of aware of regarding views. In Buddhism, it's not super cool to have a view. And so the view of superior knowledge is this 
view that's not a view or a drishti that's not a drishti. Kind of an idea. Everybody good? Cool. Number, number seven, uh, seven might be as easy as number three, but not quite. So number seven is that the Bodhisattva practicing upaya, one of the, the seventh most foremost dharma is the cultivation of all paramitas. And this one is fun. This idea that, oh, number seven is cultivating all paramitas. The reason why I like this one, and it came up even last week when I was just kind of introducing the idea of upaya, the, what came up last week was this idea that if you look at it the right way, all of these are upaya. Or there's a, a upayic way to do all these. So like in the practice of giving, you can practice generosity. And as I describe it, it's a, it's a disposition of giving. It's not, it doesn't even necessarily need to literally be in the act of giving anything to anyone. It's about this, this generous disposition. But in the act of giving or being generous, you could be upayak about it. You could employ skillful means. Where this gets really interesting is with number two, moral discipline. In the old school Buddhist way, moral discipline, moral discipline was moral discipline. And if the rule said, you don't eat afternoon, you don't eat afternoon. You don't eat after midday, period. And it's against the rules to eat after midday. And that would be in defiance of Sheila moral discipline to eat afternoon. What this is saying though, in terms of upaya, as it pertains to all the paramitas, a bodhisattva might eat afternoon. If that's the upayak thing to do, because they're not gonna be kind of hemmed into these rules that way. Because they don't, because the, the rules, how can I say this? The rules don't get any joy from being followed. <laughs> right? They're, the rules are just there. And so it's a fool, I think, that would put the rules over having lunch with a friend. if that makes sense. But you would need to upayakly assess that for yourself based on the situation. But the bodhisattva in practicing or observing all paramitas as a move of upaya, it's about reimagining how these would look if you were not just solely interested in your own uh, moral cleanliness in that way, right? Everybody good on that one? Sorry, I'm starting to kind of rush through a little bit. Not at the expense of anything. We have, we have forever, really. But if we're going to get through these 10 tonight, I'll let you know that the eighth foremost paramita in the practice of upaya for the bodhisattva is this beautiful idea. This one I am curious. What are they saying? So, yeah, okay. So they have it, seeing all dharmas as they really are. I don't think so. I don't think that actually is what it says. I don't think that's actually very helpful. But I do think it's helpful if you know that a other translation is perceiving, and this is a very important verb in Buddhism, not seeing, not thinking about, but perceiving all dharmas as thusness or like thusness. It actually gets even trickier. Yeah, it's, it gets even trickier, but the, oh, it's, it's so tricky. <laughs> so because 
because the next two on this list are very important, I'm just going to give you a little bit of this one. <laughs> so first of all, the verb, and I think I wrote it down. Yeah, the verb number eight, this one. This is guan. And guan is, if you know your, if you know Chinese and you know your bodhisattvas, guan yin, guan shi yin, avilokiteshvara, perceiver of the world sounds or perceiver of the world sorrows. Guan means to perceive. And so it's this deep, penetrating understanding. It is not with the eyes. Arguably, it's not even with the brain. It's this deep perceiving. And so this perceiving of all dharmas as thusness, if, because I know most of you have been to many dharma doors, I could say that number eight is about perceiving all individuated phenomena, all individuated dharmas, all individuated things, it, it's about perceiving all individuated things as one aspect of the concatenation of all events in the universe. Try to put that another way. This is about perceiving all of reality as a whole. And that includes you and me and everything. And so if you imagine... How could I say this? So I got this, uh, I got this Daruma doll, right? This is a Bodhidharma, Japanese Daruma doll, uh, Bodhidharma doll. And so look, red colors, white, he's got his little eye, funny eyeballs, right? So you would say that the red and the gold and then the face and the eyeballs and the nose you would say that all of those characteristics are part of this, right? But you probably wouldn't suggest that this white beard and this blue sweater, you wouldn't think that those are part of this because this is this. And what makes this this is the red face and all of that, right? What this Dharma Datu idea is, this concatenation of all events in the universe, it's an interesting idea of like, but well, why does your mind, like, why does your mind consider these things part of this, but it doesn't consider this part of this? Why not? Why does your mind draw a line between these two? Well, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't, I don't know why my mind would draw a line between those two, right? Well, let's kind of do something different, which is in the same way that all of these, the color, the shape, all of these are, at, are characteristics of this one thing. Can you take a big step back and see it all as characteristics of one big thing? Because that's kind of what's being suggested here is seeing the world as, and again, not inside and outside, but you included in it as experiencing it all as sort of one monolithic whole with a variety of characteristics. In fact, some of the characteristics get so crazy, they jump off the screen and start talking and make you think that they're separate from other things. But what we're talking about is this kind of, again, a grand concatenation of all events in the universe. And that's number, yeah, yeah. This is not, um, it doesn't refer to the, um, to the example, this very famous example that the drop in the ocean represents the whole ocean, in a sense, or holographic universe. This is not the same, right? The, wait, the what? the holographic universe like holograph yeah 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 but you said before that about the ocean and this this example that this buddhist example of um, a drop 
in the ocean or off oh, the ocean is basically yeah the ocean to is totally yes the ocean whether you're thinking of uh, talking about waves on the surface of the ocean you're talking about drops in the ocean all of that yes connie but there's one even even with those kinds of analogies there's a weird how oh, it's it's, it's still weird separate, there's still a, a certain separation between drop and ocean right between yeah. the observer and the ocean yeah. yeah that it's like you're sort of flying over the ocean in a helicopter and you're like oh look at all of reality as being a surface of an ocean but you need to dive in and be away yourself right that that's part of this idea is like it's not just about viewing so like for example here i can imagine that you're at home and you're seeing all of this and what's funny of course is that this is all flat on a screen and you don't actually have any reason to it's all one thing, right? But you think that I'm one thing and the, this is one thing. And then if we were to break this apart, you would, oh, look, there's a Bodhisattva, there's Buddha. So this this ability to break things into smaller parts is, is that that's cool or whatever. But we're talking about this kind of reverse operation, not breaking things down to smaller parts, but stitching it all back together into one giant hole including you would it be in in modern philosophy would it be um um monoism no well no and the, no and the, the reason why is because and and thanks connie that was an awesome question by the way it's it's not monism just because if if only because this is still um it's still founded on dharma, which is to say dependent origination, emptiness, mm -hmm. a kind of um, monism is sort of it, 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 that what that Western philosophical tradition sort of accepts a kind of stable reality of which everything is just one block of. But in Buddhism, everything is still uh dynamically changing every moment there is never anything statically the same and so even that grand monism is constantly changing and subject to a kind of dependent origination so i would argue connie that it's 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 not even monism mm -hmm. okay in that cool. thank you okay i'm gonna have to just quickly two minutes one minute of dharma i'm gonna have to do this Number nine, it's my one, it's becoming my favorite Chinese verb. I want to, um, I actually, I, I found the Sanskrit, but it has to do with this character here, which is a hand with three ears. So the Chinese character, the radical of it is a hand. The other part of it is there are these three ears and it means to harmonize. And you can imagine the hand as like a conductor and the three ears as the orchestra. And there's this way of harmonizing. So that's a beautiful verb. And this is a wild idea. The Bodhisattva, the ninth practice of the Bodhisattva is to harmonize their power. Actually, it's harmonizing inconceivable power. So if you're familiar with this idea of inconceivability in Buddhism, this is about the Bodhisattva harmonizing inconceivable power. And, you know, because next week is about Bala or power and the powers, I'm not gonna, I, I don't even have the time to get into it tonight. But the idea is, is that this eighth or ninth practice of the Bodhisattva is about gathering together or again harm harmonizing their inconceivable power and number 10 the 10th dharma in the practice of upaya is the stage the stage of non-regression 
in the in the bodhisattva path or the bodhisattva career the idea is is that you go through these various stages and yes i just went off on this whole thing about how the bodhisattva doesn't do the shravaka stages and the pratyekya buddha stages but i kept saying there are bodhisattva stages so they've just abandoned or liberated themselves from the old school path but there are these bodhisattva stages and the idea is, is that the bodhisattva can kind of go up the stages and maybe then start, go down the stages a little bit. It's been a better week. We're up on stage three, stage four, up oh, back down stage two. But the idea is, is that of these, and by the way, there are 10 stages of bodhisattva hood. The idea is, is that at a certain point, the bodhisattva reaches the stage of non-regression. There's no more sliding back down. This has a lot to do with what the sutra talked about. Um, I think it was last week with Pranya or, or two weeks ago with Pranya where I talked about how at the sixth paramita level of Pranya, the bodhisattva sees or perceives all phenomena as empty all the time. Before the sixth, before they have fully developed prajna, the bodhisattva knows everything is empty. <laughs> like they know it intellectually, they've read this, they know it, but they don't actually see the world that way. But there reaches a certain point in the bodhisattva's career where they literally perceive the world at, through the lens of emptiness and they can no longer not see it that way. That's sort of part of this idea of non-regression, not going back to uh, the ways of a worldling where you see things as permanent versus impermanent. If you're thinking about dukkha or suffering, it's no longer getting misconstrued about what is and is not suffering. You know it, it very well what is suffering, right? And the idea of self or anatman, no self. There's a way that the bodhisattva is like, well, I know that there's anat there, I know that there's no self, but it sure feels like there's a self. And then at the stage of non-regression, the bodhisattva is solid on what not only what does that mean, but it is again, you know, the very makeup of of the intellect at that point. So okay.